This is part three of the Cognitive Theories of Multimedia and Instructional Design Lecture. We ended part two talking about less is more. Less is more in the sense that it's important not to overload your learner's cognitive processing capabilities. Remember that multimedia instruction should not strive to teach with the least amount of cognitive load possible but at a level that is appropriately tailored to the prior knowledge of your learner. So this slide doesn't seem to support the less is more approach, but we're actually going to break down the rest of the lecture into two additional parts. The first is to discuss the cognitive theory, and that's the information on the left of the screen. These are the cognitive effects that are covered in Richard Mayer's research behind the science of e-learning. They were developed to help multimedia creators to provide cognitive guidance to their learners throughout the learning process. To the right, under instructional design, these are effects or principles extracted from Stephen Sodden's writings. Instructional design principles are based on cognitive theory. With instructional design, the solution isn't to take away content, but to present it in a simpler way. Less is more. When you decide what to leave out, it's essential to consider what content when removed will not harm the backbone of the learning. In the middle, we see three principles, and this is where cognitive theory and instructional design overlap. They both refer to these three principles or effects. Both cognitive theory and multimedia and instructional design principles support learning retention and the transfer of knowledge. So we are going to start with the cognitive theories. And the core is the multimedia effect. Simply put, it's that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. When words and pictures are both presented, learners have the chance to construct verbal and visual cognitive representations and integrate them. Here we have three different signs from three countries. Can you guess the meaning for each sign? Well, let's look at the first road sign. It's actually a sign from Ireland. Warning of exits off of a confusing roundabout. What about the second sign? That is from South Africa, and it warns that there should be no unauthorized food vendors in the area. And then we have the last sign. This took me quite a while to figure out what it meant. I did recognize the language as being Croatian, so that was my prior knowledge, but I couldn't put it together what an individual in a wheelchair carrying a rifle would actually mean but it actually represents the Croatian Disabled Homeland War Veterans Association. So pictures by themselves are fine, but when they're partnered with words, you're going to get the ultimate multimedia effect, allowing your learner to construct those verbal and visual cognitive representations and to integrate them. Now we'll talk about spatial contiguity. People learn better 
when corresponding words and pictures are presented at the same time or next to each other on screen. This was a huge challenge for me in school. Nothing would frustrate me more than if I'm reading a paragraph and they refer to a figure or to a diagram that was either the page before or the page after, or I had to hunt for it on the page I was reading. This block of text actually supports the working memory diagram that we covered earlier in the lecture. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to scan back and forth between the text and the diagram and then integrate that information together? Spatial contiguity very simply states that placing supporting text near the graphics improves the learning. It's also known as the proximity principle. You always want to eliminate separated presentation. That's where your learner has to do a lot of scanning to determine which part of the graphic or animation corresponds with the text that's presented. We next have the personalization or individualization principle. When you create a narration, if it's conducted in a conversational style, first or second person, rather than a formal style, like third person, it improves learner engagement. Let's look and listen to a set of fire drill instructions created for special needs learners. The first example is conducted in a formal style. There will be fire drills at the school. The alarm will be loud, but it is loud so it can be heard by everyone. Students will evacuate the school building quickly and safely. This is what students must do if there is a real fire. When the alarm rings, students will line up in their room. Students will walk down the hall and out the door. Students will remain quiet so they can hear teachers. So how did that make you feel? Do you have a learner where the more formal style of narrative would be absolutely appropriate? We'll hear this instruction video again, but this time the narrative is done with a more conversational style. Have you ever had a fire drill at your school? The fire alarm is so loud. It may scare you the first time you hear it. Your teacher will say it is loud so everyone can hear it. During a fire drill, you practice getting out of the school building quickly and safely. This is what your teacher will tell you to do if we have a real fire. When the alarm rings, you will line up in your room. Then you will quietly walk down the hall and out the door. You must stay quiet so you can hear your teacher. Now, how did this version make you feel? In most situations, the use of personalization will engage your learner more. But let's say your learner responds better to more formal instructions. This is where it's most important that you understand your learner in order to design appropriate for their needs. Now we have the coherence principle. Don't provide an overwhelming amount of information or extraneous information. You may think that the extra graphics or animations may be entertaining to your learner and may help improve engagement. But instead, 
they are likely distracting from the key elements for learning. Busy backgrounds, decorations, graphics, or animations are often just enough to overwhelm the visual sensory memory, creating cognitive overload. Consider instead using a cleaner or more simplified way to communicate information, especially if it's complex. Taking a simplified approach is also very effective when creating pre-training exercises. And speaking of pre-training, where applicable, training on a task or with materials before presenting that material as multimedia improves retention and learning. Pre-training creates prior knowledge. It also provides the necessary repetition for retention, repeat to remember. Some of you may recognize this from stage six, functional learning. It's the explore activity for that stage. Stages is an excellent example of the explore activities as pre-training. This pre-training activity allows the learner to explore different articles of clothing and how they may be used. Once the pre-training or explore activities are completed, the learner then moves on to the assessment. There he sees the exact same elements from pre-training used within a new context. This assists your learner in clearly demonstrating his understanding and helps with the transfer of knowledge. The next theory or principle is signaling. People learn better when the material is organized with clear outlines and hierarchies. The layout of your activities should have clear levels of importance. It should be easy to recognize what is a title, what is a header, what's the body text, and what should be attended to first on screen. In looking at this, what is your eye drawn to first? Typically, it's the larger of the bold text in the first bullet point, but that's not the title of the page. That's above it. And that's where you should want your eye to go first. Signaling also uses visual cues such as arrows and highlights, underlines. All these help your learner understand the order in which he must organize information. On this screen, the title is clearly identified at the top of the page, highlighted in strong bold, the largest text. The bullets are clearly identified on the page and your eye naturally flows down the page following the bulleted sequence. In addition to the design hierarchies, you also see other signals that can be used to assist your learner. Page numbering styles, such as indicating page one of four, or task monitoring signals to help identify exactly where he is as he progresses in a task. All of these are signals of what is essential information and how it should be processed in terms of importance. Another important principle is segmenting or pacing. Let your learner control the pace of your activity. Allow time between presentation segments. Avoid continuous narrations without breaks. Oh, did you get all that on that screen? It looks like the screen progressed automatically before you had a chance to read all the text. Pacing empowers your learner. It will allow her the time she may need to engage in selecting, organizing, and integrating the incoming information. Using timed events like automatic page turns or switching tasks automatically 
use those very sparingly or not at all. Whenever appropriate, allow your learner to start, stop, or repeat an activity or multimedia component at will. If you can, present the information in segments. The segmenting or the chunking of the information allows your learner the time to organize and integrate the visual and auditory information. Then when they are ready for the next segment, they can move on at their own pace. The last cognitive theory that we'll look at is synchronizing. Synchronizing is very similar to the spatial contiguity effect. If the presentation of corresponding auditory and visual information is successive, your learner will first need to hold the auditory information in one channel's working memory until the corresponding visual material is presented in the other channel. A simple example is separating a narrative from its video. Dolphins. The Atlantic bottlenose dolphins are small cetaceans. They have a long beak-like snout, a sickle-shaped dorsal fin, and sharp teeth. These dolphins live in small family groups called pods. Now try and remember that as you watch the video. When presentation of corresponding auditory and visual material is simultaneous, there isn't a need to hold one representation in working memory until the other is presented. To prevent cognitive overload, synchronize your presentation of these corresponding visual and auditory pieces of information. The Atlantic bottlenose dolphins are small cetaceans. They have a long beak-like snout, a sickle-shaped dorsal fin, and sharp teeth. These dolphins live in small family groups called pods. Now I know this was a long segment of this lecture. So again, I'm encouraging that you take a break this will be the conclusion of part three. And in part four of the lecture series, we'll address the overlap between cognitive theory and instructional design, and we'll also cover instructional design. See you in part four.